So we continue our meeting and we give the word to Sister Maria Antoinetta, who was so good to prepare this presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Sister Maria Antonieta, uh, as general assistant in charge of the English and Spanish speaking province. And our dear Mother General asked me to present to you the progress of the process of canonization of our dear Mother, Blessed Mother Maria Teresa of St. Joseph, and the process of beatification of the servant of God. Sister Maria, Sister Teresa of the Most Holy Trinity. Originally, this talk was going to be presented by Sister Maria Asunta, who in recent years has been in Rome working on these processes, but due to health problems, she has not been able to be present. And this is why I am now presenting to you this topic. For this, I have made use of information that Sister Maria Sunta and Father Marco Chiesa, our postulator, sent to me, and also many information that Sister Maria del Sagrado Corazón from Nicaragua sent to me about different uh, witnesses in the case of our dear mother Palace. Many of you were present and the beatification of our dear mother Congress, what happened in May 13, 2006. And the miracle that made possible her beatification was the healing of the foot of Mrs. Peters from the Netherlands. Since this process had, since the beatification happened, uh, the devotion to our dear mother has been increased a lot worldwide. And we have been receiving requests from relics, prayers, petitions, and answer to prayers from many countries in the world, especially from the Asian region. She was involved not, not only in health problems, but also in a spiritual vocations. For example, a Polish priest chose her as her patroness in her ordination. Her self autobiography has been translated into 10 languages and now can be also be read in Polish and Russian. Okay, the difference between beatification and canonization does not light on a great degree of holiness of the person, but refers to the veneration, but refers to the veneration. After the beatification, the blessed may be venerated in one diocese. And in, the, in this case, in our case, where our dear mother in the diocese of Norma in the Netherlands, and also in all our convents and in the convents of the Carmelite. After the canonization, the blessed can be a uh, worldwide venerated. So for the beatification, it is required and another miracle that should happen after the beatification. And we have this possibility, and we move to the next slideshow. Uh, to the approval of uh, the miracle of the healing of a child from Nicaragua that took place in Christmas of 2017. We will go with more detail on this miracle and we will approach this miracle from different points because the whole fact is surrounded for many uh, miracles events. So we have the dreams of Marta, Julia Marta Perez Lopez. We have the illness of Jose Pablo, 
the medical testimonies and Rome's opinion. So this lady, Marta, she's 67 years old, is a psychologist, and she, she belongs to a group of prayers in the parish in Managua, although she belongs, she lives in another city. And she went many times to our retreat house in San Marcos. Being there, she saw the picture that we see in the slideshow of our dear mother. And she asked one of the sisters who she is. And one of the sisters explained about our dear mother, gave her a book of the biography of our dear mother, a holy card with a prayer for asking favors to our dear mother. And then we didn't see her for a while. And then she began to have dreams. From August 14 to November 1st, 2017. In her dreams, Marta saw several times a child crying and screaming in pain. Our lady was at his side. Marta asked to our lady what happened with the child. And our lady smiled and tell her that the child was sick. She has to pray fast, pray the rosary for him. This dream was repeated many times. But in October 30th, when our, the dream happened again and she saw uh, the child, for first time, our lady mentioned the name of the child. Our lady told her that his name was Jose Maria. And Marta asked her, what does the child have? And our lady smiled, touched his head and his legs and said, the, the little one does not walk. He has a malformation in the cerebellum. He has chiari. Marta did not know that word, and she didn't understand what Our Lady meant with that. And she said to Our Lady, little mother, heal him. At that moment, our dear mother Fontress appeared in the dream. She recognized her because she saw her in the picture in our retreat house in San Marcos. And Our Lady, smiling, said to her, now you, you will ask for the intercession of my daughter, Maria Teresa. And Martha said to her, if you are the mother of God, why don't you heal him? And she smiled and said, yes, I can. But now you will ask this miracle of love to my daughter, Maria Teresa for her canonization, because she carries the word of love of my son, which is the word that, the, that they, and they, what she was referring to the Carmelite sisters, carry, which is a word for the most unprotected. And that it be shown that there is no human intervention, only divine. Then she trusted to Marta to take this message to Jose Maria parents, Marta in anguish asked to her where she could find him. And she told her that she has to do it soon because the child was going to travel. When she wake up, she didn't know what to do, how to find a child with the name Jose Maria in a city, <laughs> not knowing any last name, not knowing anything about it, only the name Jose Maria. So she went early in the morning to mass and she asked to the blessed sacrament to help her to find the child. When she came back home, she looked for the novena in honor to our dear mother that she had received before. She made copies and then she called all the girls of a prayer group that she has to meet in the afternoon. Then she called to a friend 
Her name is Paula Barreto. And she told to her everything about this dream because she didn't know what to do. <laughs> and this Paula said, Marta, I have a friend whose child has the same symptoms that you are mentioning. Marta could not believe that so far she could find the child <laughs> that she needed to find. And then Paula said, uh, Marta said to Paula, please go find the parents and tell them about this dream and give the, uh, and I will, I will give you the, the prayer so they can also pray to, to Maria, to Blessed Mother Maria Teresa. And Paula was in problem because she felt skeptical about this, how she will go to uh, these parents and tell them that somebody has a dream, tell them that they have to pray to this nun until and the child will be okay. But since the symptoms were so similar, so she take courage and, and went to look for the child, for the parents. And the parents in that time were making all these arrangements to travel. And they hear whatever Paula had to say, and they promised to pray, to say the prayer. So now we're gonna talk a, lot, a little bit about this illness of, uh, Oh, Jose Pablo. Okay. This is the word that uh, Marta here from our dear lady saying that this child had carry malformation. Uh, we have in the picture one uh, is the a normal brain and the other is who has the yellow circle, the one who has the carry malformation. This is a disease that can be in different shape, different type. The ones that uh, Jose Maria has is type one, which means that this can develop until the late childhood, and uh, other in some other people in the adolescence or in the adult age. Because it is that whether uh, the scale is not, is had a malformation, is not well formed, or that the brain will grow faster than the bones. So that's why that is not a space for the brain to keep grow growing. And then the, the, this last part of the brain, this is the cerebellum. And then these are these uh, membranes that are the tonsils, won't have a space. And for, therefore, they will try to when they grow, they don't have space, so they go down into the spinal canal, trying to find it. And when they go in a place that is not for them, they make pressure in the spinal uh, cord because all the nerves are there. They begin to produce pain, and if the uh, depression keep going, then it will be damaging the nerves, and then you, the, the person could have a weaknesses and the and the members and the in the legs, and they can if it does progress, it will be also a breathing problem, breathing problem difficulties to swallow and everything. So, so many. But the point is that not everybody will develop the self symptoms. Some people can have carry my information without symptoms. Some can begin just with a pain and have pain in more life. Others will be developed other, the, the other symptoms that will be uh, put in risk their life. So Jose Pablo began with this problem uh, in the months of March and April of 2017. It because everything with just headaches. They couldn't find the reason why they had headaches in Nicaragua. So the parents decided to travel to the United States because they had the possibility to do so. And they went to the Baptist Hospital in Miami. They make an MRI there and they found the uh, herniation of six milli millimeters. Uh, you will see in the picture there are all the hospitals that they were in all these hospitals, they make the MRI 
and all have the same diagnosis. Herniation of six millimeters that is carried type one. Because if it's less, it has to be higher than five millimeters to be considered care. So uh, since in that moment it was only headache, the hospital decided just to send him home with medicine and keep observation, follow up with the, uh, the neuro, neuro, neurologist in the country to see if he developed. I'm sorry, but I really can hear the people in the room. They live 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 in the room. Yeah, there is a return from the loudspeaker, please say. Uh, so we have to put this away or? Yeah. So this is the speaker. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, we will put all these um, headphones zero, number zero. on number zero, so we don't need them this one. And it will be easier for the translator. Zero is no. You're welcome. So since in that time it was only a headache, then he went back to Nicaragua with pain medicine. And yeah, the indication to go to the neuro, neuro, neurologist in case something else happened. Well, the symptoms getting worse every time. And in November 2017, they decided to travel to Costa Rica, but they make another MRI and again, diagnose carry type one. The symptom continued to worse. He could not longer walk. It was like a force pulling him from his back and making him fall backwards. The doctors in Costa Rica told him that he needed a surgery to release the compression of the tonsils because as the symptoms were getting worse and that means there was too much pressure and uh, provoking the nerves to be irritated. And that was the, the result was that symptom. Uh, but this operation was not being made in Costa Rica. So they recommended to travel again to the United States and try to get there the surgery. So it, that was in, in November. So when Marta had the dream and look for the parents was in this time when he was going to travel to Costa Rica. So they began seeing that to prayer to our dear mother. But in the end of November, they decided to go to Niklaus Children Hospital in Miami. Again, the diagnosis confirmed, Chiari type one, six millimeter of herniation. And they also, it says, no, no, still not surgery. They go back with painkiller and therapies because their legs were losing the muscle. He wasn't able to walk anymore. So they came back to Nicaragua. And in December 18, 2017, the pain was unbearable. He has four to five crises of pain every day. And each episode lasted for one to two hours. The pain was in the base of the skull. He was not able to walk. He, was, he began to have swallowing problems and also difficulty in breathing. So, and he began to use morphine with the pain. Uh, the child said to her mom, I don't want more morphine. It doesn't help me. The pain is still the same. Just pray, pray help me more. And 
from her mom, can you imagine how difficult it was to see the child crying all the time with this pain and being able to do anything? They went to the hospital in Nicaragua and uh, the, when the doctor saw him, they made more tests and said, definitely he needs to have the surgery immediately. But the problem was uh, the surgeon in Nicaragua had never done that surgery before. And you say, but I could try it because if he does have the surgery, he could have a, a pulmonary and cardio uh, attack any moment, arrest. So they say, if he, she, he doesn't have the surgery now, he can die any moment. And if he go to the United States in a normal play, he will die during the, 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 the flight. So they didn't know what to do. Parents were despair what to do in this moment. And they just call Marta and say, we don't know what to do. They say, we have to go to, to the America, but he won't endure the, the, the travel. So Marta said, don't worry, just go. Everything will be okay. So they make contact with a energy, uh, energy no, surgeon and in the Memorial Hermann Hospital in Houston. They sent all the documentation that they have, all the tests that they have, he read everything, and Dr. Sandberg agreed to have the surgery. So, but for that, they had to, to get an ambulance plane. So he was able to go to Miami with all the equipment necessary in case that something happened during the trip. They arrived there and Dr. Sandberg explain to them all the consequences and how it was going to be the surgery. The parents were scared because in order to relieve the tonsil, that means they had to remove one part of the bones in the, in, in the skull to give space to the tonsil. And then they had to put a kind of a net to protect the tonsils. So it's not it's something not that easy, no? And we have one sister who had a problem, had a surgery, and the sister cannot, I mean, there are consequences after the surgery. You cannot wait any, you cannot lift any heavy things. You, you have to be very careful in many things pain. and pain you can even have. It, so it was not easy for the parents. And they were always like, but Marta said he's gonna be okay. <laughs> you know, just keep praying. And the doctor Sandberg said, well, I, I, we will just put a stable situation with him and make another test. We, have, we will need a long sedation process. So they put him, they took a little bit of time until he was able to do more tests. But on December 15, 25, uh, this is Christmas, the pain began to be less. So uh, they were happy about that, but they made the MRI the 27th of December, and that was only four millimeters of herniation. So from sex, it went to, to four millimeters. And the doctor said, well, if it's only four, we cannot do anything. We don't need to make a surgery because with the surgery, that's what we're gonna get. So he doesn't need a surgery and cannot be considered anymore a care in my formation. It's just a headache. So they gave only pain medicine, therapies, and he has to go back home. So in the beginning of January uh, 2018, he went back home. The pain every day was less and less and less. And in February, they make another MRI in Nicaragua, in February 2018, and it was only three millimeters. And he began to recover until have no more pain at all. He has therapy, he begins to walk, he plays soccer, he lives now a very normal life. In May 2019, he contracted a tropical disease in Nicaragua that is very common there, it's called dengue. For some reason, and God permit that, it was a misdiagnosed, and he began to receive a lot of corticosteroids, who make him to have, again, problem with his legs, weakness in the muscles, and everything was scared. Is something happening? Is everything going back? 
So they make another MRI. And this time it was absolutely nothing, no herniation at all. So God permitted that he got this disease in order just to show us that everything was closed. So the doctors who knew about his history, about what happened of the six, six millimeter herniation that he has, all the symptoms that he has, and the doctor said to the person who was doing the test, but measure well. I said, but doctor, what are I gonna measure? It's absolutely nothing there. It's a, just a normal brace, nothing to measure. Are you sure it's the same boy? I said, yes, it's the same boy. But so this, this last illness from, of him just happened for a confirmation. Is everything closed? So uh, the doctors, of course, were all very happy. And the mother is so interested in this process, our dear mother, because she suffered so much seeing his child with so much pain for months. And there are so many people who saw Jose Pablo crying, screaming in pain, and they all are ready to give testimony because they know it was not a surgery, he just recovered by himself. But what happened was special also that Marta and the night of the 24th to the 25th of December have another dream. And in the dream appears again our lady and told to her, the child is already healed. And that was the day when he began to, to be better. So this happened, so when he was in Houston. So the one point now is, it seems everything has to be moved to Houston, the process. So even though the child is from Nicaragua, everything began in Nicaragua, but the date of the healing is the Christmas of 2017 when he was in Houston. So the postulator recommend that this has to be moved to Houston, especially because also Nicaragua is uh, the political situation in our country is difficult, is a uh, persecution with the church. So the people cannot freely go to Nicaragua. So they decide since the place of what happened, the, the miracle was in Houston, so to move it to Houston. That means we have to open the process again in Houston, but America still keep their borders closed. <laughs> they keep the borders closed, but I, I heard that they uh, are supposed to open in November. Somebody of you told me, so we live in hope. Where so far, so the, because the, the dog, the they need, okay, we all these papers were submitted, no, to Rome. Uh, uh, doctors here saw all the papers, everything, and say, yes, here is something. So they did give a green light for that. But now they got to see the boy. They had to see that it's any scar of the surgery there. They had to see that the boy is okay and they had to begin the process and documentations in Houston. So, but they need to go to Houston. So we are hoping that America open the border so they can go to Houston and they're also allowed to Jose Pablo to go because their parents are ready. They say, well, if we had to go to Rome, we go to Rome. If we had to go to Houston, we go to Houston because they want this because they say, as big was my, my uh, Luz Maria, who is the mom of Jose Pablo, said, as big was my pain and my suffering seeing so so, my son in that condition, so big is now my interest in this canonization and my gratitude to, to our dear mother. So we just keep praying that this is possible because we have the green light from Rome, but we need now, also we are being, the pandemic is doing something here and make difficult this process. <laughs> and well, I don't know if you had noticed that I have been talking about Jose Maria and Jose Pablo. So the point is here. We asked Luz Maria, the mom of Jose Pablo, why our dear lady called him Jose Maria and you say Jose Pablo? And you say, well, the point is that I wanted to have a big family with many children. And then she has two 
boys and she wasn't able to get pregnant again. So she was despair and praying and everything, nothing. And one priest told to her, well, pray to the infant Jesus of Prague. She will give you a child. And she said, okay. And she prayed and promised to our lady, if she has a boy, his name was going to be Jose Maria. But when the child was born, the older brother said, man, I'm just gonna call him Jose Maria because in our language, the Jose Maria is called Shema. And they say Shema or Shemita, and the people doesn't like that. They say, no, they're gonna call him Shema. Don't put him Jose Maria. So and they finally put him Jose Pablo. But for our dear lady, of course, it's Jose Maria because she had promised to call him Jose Maria. And she took care of him through our the intercession of our dear mothers and the dreams of Martha. And then we had the testimony of the doctors. The principal doctor who is very willing to give the testimony is Dr. Cantanero, who is the neurosurgeon from Nicaragua who saw the child. But now she's living in Mexico because the pandemic and the persecution in Nicaragua. So she left to, to, to Mexico, but she is really, really convinced that this just is a miracle. That's what happened is a miracle. And she's ready to give the testimony. And we have all these hard copies of the results of the MRIs, the CDs with the picture of the herniation. So the herniation is there. It can be measured for any surgeon, with any neurologist to see the herniation and then the other MRI that says no herniation. They can see, they can measure if they want it. So we have all these documents. And thanks to God, these people were able, had money enough to make all these travels, to make all, because it's different that you present a, a test or a diagnosis only from my country, Nicaragua, because we don't have so many things, but it's coming from Costa Rica, from the United States, and from my country, Nicaragua. So there are enough proof of this uh, miracle event that happened. Uh, so we are, Rom give the green light. We are just waiting for that. He and the postulator who it was in the general chapter that from the Carmelite that just happened two weeks ago, I think. He said after this chapter, he was going to try to move faster the, the, the process and see what we can do about it. And, and there are many other testimonies that I'm gonna share with you also. Uh, also for our dear mother, this is Nestor also from Nicaragua. His case was uh, his, her, his mom, Angela Lanusa, was 35 years, no, 35 weeks of pregnancy when she met uh, Marta. And at that time, the mom, uh, Angela went to her, her normal checkup of, her, of his pregnancy, and they found that the child was suffering of perinatal asphyxia. So the life of the child was in danger, and the doctor said he has to be, he has to come out. So they decided the following day to do a cesarean section to take the baby, and when he was born. Uh, he has a pulmonary hypertension. He was in a serious condition and has to be intubated immediately. He has pulmonary effusion and severe pneumonia. The chance of life of the child was numb. So the parents were so sad and praying a lot. The man was discharged after the surgery, but the child has to stay in the uh, ICU for the 28 days, he was intubated all this time. And, the, and one day they received a call for, a phone call from the hospital say, you have to come now because he's not gonna make it. So they went to the hospital, they saw the child, he was all blue, you know, cyanotic. And it was almost like dying that moment. They were just crying and praying, and they called Martha and they said, Martha, don't worry, he's gonna be okay. <laughs> and he needs also a, a evaluation by the cardiologist. And so everyone was 
just a cow. They were just despair in that moment. And, but he recovered. And the doctor, the director of the hospital come the parents and said, are you believers? They said, yes, we believe. Why? Because what just happened now is a miracle. He was literally dying. And the, even the cardiologists and the doctors cannot explain how he, in just a moment, began to change the condition. And she was able to be, to take out the tube because she was intubated and, and recovered. Because the time that he was without enough oxygen in the brain, he has a kind of paralyzing one part of the brain. So, but he's recovering with therapy and everything. He's now be able to do same some words and, and, but it was a child that was literally dying. And the doctor, he said, he couldn't believe when they came out from this room after trying to help the child, he, she was just astounded. He said, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened, but it, they couldn't do anything. And then the child just began to change the condition and, and recover. And of course, because the prayers had been to our dear mother, then they think it's also by the intercession of our dear mother. Now we have also this case in Brazil. It was in the echo in May of the, this year. And this is Samuel. Their parents uh, got married in 2015 and they were hoping to get pregnant very soon because the mom was uh, having some issue with fibroids in the uterus and it was going to be difficult to get pregnant but uh, the, time pa the time passed and she was unable to get pregnant. So in the end of October, 2017, they had to have a surgery I, you see in that in the picture, uh, what is this fibrous? And it was no place there to have, to get pregnant, to have a baby there. So they had to remove all these fibers and they make a surgery. And um, it was a very high risk that they will also have to remove the uterus to do a, a hysterectomy because it was too much. The father was praying to our dear mother, he received this prayer for our sister in Itauna. And uh, they ha he has the relic of our dear mother. And then the surgery was uh, uh, was, was well, as succeed. And, uh, but the doctor said, we had planned to take nine fibros and we found 22. So, <laughs> yeah, but the uterus was saved. So they didn't have to remove it. They, they were able to save the uterus, but any pregnancy was going to be a very high risk. If she finally have another surgery in March of 2019 to remove more fibers. Um, she wasn't able even to get pregnant. So in this time, they were already four years and they get married and nothing. They were beginning to think, well, that's gonna be possible. So they offered to her to have a artificial fertilization which they uh, refuse to have because they are believers and they don't want to go against the, but the church uh, says that's the doctrine of the church about this artificial fertilization. Um, they were all considering to have an adoption because she was not getting pregnant. But, and, the, and by the prayers of our dear mother and the end of 2019, she got pregnant and she was able to get born to this beautiful baby that we see in the picture on July 26, 2020. It's a strong baby, very healthy. So her parents are very, very grateful to the intercession of our dear mother. And we have another case also in Nicaragua. This is Dagoberto Hernandez. And this was a related for her daughter, Rosibel Hernandez. He has three uh, blocked arteries. And in October 5th, 2020, Dagoberto was in the ambulance on the way to the hospital for emergency surgery for blockage in three arteries, stroke and pre-infarction. On the way to the hospital, Rosibel, her daughter, was in a car behind the ambulance. And when they were about 100 meters to reach to the hospital, 
the uh, Rosibel saw, I mean, the ambulance went to the hospital, but Rosibel saw on the side ro of the road, another car who was damaged. And she was with her cousin who is uh, me mechanical. So they stopped to help the people there. When they would tell, yeah, we just, my, my, my father is going to the hospital, but we want to help you, what happened? And the person who was in this car was Marta. <laughs> the one from the dream of Jose Pablo. So she gave to, to her the prayers of our dear mother and said, just pray to her and he's gonna be okay. So they helped Marta to fix the car and, and they after that went to the hospital. By that time, uh, Dagoberto was already in the surgery and he managed to recover from the surgery. He came out from the surgery. Even when the, the surgery happened, he has another pre-infarction uh, pre there in the, in the how do you say? Surgery room? Mm -hmm. Okay. But he came out okay. And the night after in his recovering, it was about 2 a.m. And the daughter was with him. And he began to hear that this the Dagoberto began to moaning and being like suffocating. And she saw that the this pillow was full of blood. They call the doctor and they say one day the artery got disconnected. He has to, to do another surgery again. And so he put a, and the daughter was so scared, call Marta again, don't worry, everything will be okay. I am praying also for him. So he came out for the surgery again. He was in the ICU for a while and then moved to another uh, room. But it seems that the, the the daughters, it was two daughters taking care of him and didn't say to her that they had to, to be careful with him, not to move him so much. And he tried to raise him up. And that moment, some wires that are here, they got disconnected. And they make an x-ray, they saw the wires broken, and they say, we had to have another surgery, third surgery. After this third surgery, he came out, he was in the room, and then he suddenly said to her daughter, daughter, who is this lady who came into the room and said, it, and said in my ear, Dagoberto, don't worry, you're gonna be okay, soon you are going home. And the daughter said that nobody has entered in the room. Say, of course, and she was dressed as a nun. <laughs> So everything, everybody thinks it was our dear mother and he recovered and there is Dagoberto, <laughs> healthy. Of course, they had to take care of some diet because his problem, <laughs> but he is healthy. I mean, in, in what is the measure of his condition, but he was able to recover for three surgeries and which is amazing. I think we have to make a break. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, um... We will make a break now uh, before we continue with our sister Teresa of the Most Blessed Trinity. Five minutes. You want to eat today? Yes. Sister. Okay. Now we hear more echo. No? Sister Teresa of the Most Holy Trinity, Teresa Isolde, was born in November 13. 1897 in Appledorf, Netherlands, and she entered our Carmel of the Divine Heart of Jesus in Tilburg on October 2nd, 1917. After her first profession in December 1919, she traveled with other seven Dutch sisters as a missionary to America, where our dear mother foundress was busy in new foundations and urgently needed sisters. However, as soon as she arrived, the Calvary began with a painful kidney ailment that was recognized much too late. She suffered the great pain with heroic patient without complaining and without taking painkiller with a smile on her mouth. She only said, Jesus suffered even more for me. On March 10, 1926, she died in St. Louis Hospital in call of sainthood. Her grave remains 
to this day in the Holy Cross Cemetery in Milwaukee. In his death certificate, we find that the cause of death was tuberculous nephritis. However, the symptoms she presented were more suggestive of lupus nephritis. If we read her biography, she said that she suffered for a stiffness in her arm, in her hands, in her knees. And this is caused by lupus who is normally related also with a, uh, oh my God. with kind of arthritis, rheumatism. Rheumatism. Yeah. <clears throat> But she suffered is a lot of pain. We have one sister in Nicaragua who just died from COVID, who has a lupus, and uh, the pain is terrible. She has to take so very uh, high doses of painkiller, and now I can imagine how was the pain that she suffered without any painkiller, and she was able to. She tried to work the most as she could, and for a young woman. Can you imagine how terrible she was called to go to America to help? And as soon as she arrived there, she wasn't able to help as much as she could because her illness. So it was also internal suffering because they say, I came here to help and now I am being a burden for the sisters. But she took everything with patience, with love, offering all these things for the salvation of soul. And it was in such a way that even our dear mother recognized her sanctity. And she herself recommended to all the sisters to offer or, or to ask through her intercession when it was something needed in any convent. So her autobiography was a public in, even in that time, time of our dear mother, in Dutch, in German, and in English. Her uh, devotion was very, very well spread in, in Europe and also in America. And our dear mother uh, called her the passion flower. So, uh, because the witness that she gave during her illness with all his patients, uh, even in the hospital, all the nurses will uh, say, you no, know, how she can suffer so much pain and still be smiling and still be so calm. So her witness that it was very touching to all the people around her, not only for the sister, but also in the hospital. Uh, her life, as I said, was a, this, the, her biography was also a, posted in one of the magazines in, in Netherlands. And he was, she was a, called as a patron of the people who work in, a, in factories because she used to work in a factory before she entered our convent. Uh, one of the cases uh, just after her death was uh, the healing of one Mexican boy who has a skin skin uh, illness. He was in bed and the sister went to pray in the chapel and suddenly they saw this child coming uh, to the chapel dressed and healed. And they asked him, and he said, well, the sister came to help me to get dressed. And when he saw the picture of, uh, of our sister, uh, Teresa of the Holy Trinity, she saw uh, it was her, but she was much more beautiful. <laughs> so this uh, devotion of, uh, to her was so big, but it stopped in 1938 by the death of our dear mother Fondres, because all the attention was given to her, to our dear mother Fondres to begin her process. We want her to be the first one to, to be canonized. And it was decided to, to give the, the place to our dear mother to, to be in this process and everything for her canonization. And so every devotion and everything is stopped about uh, our dear sister and she has to wait. And it has happened that after the beatification of our dear mother, it was decided that, uh, well, our dear mother had already a devotion to her. And in the eyes of our dear mother, she was a saint. So we have to open the process. And it was opened in Roman for our 
Bishop in that time, Bishop Beers Rorman, on April 15, 2010, began the diocesan trial, collecting all materials and documents necessary. And it was difficult because most of the ice witnesses had already died because it was so many years ago, but uh, they managed to get the more information possible. And all this material collected was brought to Rome in 2015 and given to the secretary of the congregation for the causes of saints. After that, it is necessary to prepare the positio, which is a work of approximately 400 to 500 pages. So more uh, documentation were necessary to get more testimonies and everything. In order to this is to prove that she lived the virtues in a heroic way. And if the also if her female sanctity is spread, if how many people uh, consider her as a saint and uh, praying for her intercession. So Sister Maria Sunta began this task in December 2018 uh, under the direction of the re relator in charge, Monsignor Paul Palaz. And she even went to America. It was time of COVID already, so it was a very hard time. But uh, she managed to get all the information necessary to fulfill this position. And she was able to get this, complete this work on May of this year, 2021. And now it's in the process of uh, to, to review the translation in Italian. One, this is a product that had to be printed. And then this posizio is gonna go to the uh, two different, uh, what do they call? Mm, commissions, the historical commission, and after that to the theological commission, and then to the cardinals. And the Pope is the one who has the last word. So this is in process now. But we have also an answer a prayer that happened in Canada and was through the prayers also for our sisters in Ontario. Uh, this is Bennett, that also was in our echo in May. Um, it was in April 2020 after several tests that they found out that the, uh, Natalie who was pregnant uh, so that the baby was with a very severe spina bifida. And the probability of the baby uh, to get to full term was very little. And he was going to, to be able to get to full, well, they thought it was gonna be premature. And he was able to, to what do you say, to calm? To calm. Yeah, well, he was only last, a couple of hours at the most a couple of days it was not a any any yeah so they offered to the man to finish the pregnancy to have an abortion but the parents say no we are not going to do that we want to continue with that pregnancy and we will face whatever it happened whatever God wants for us and so two weeks before the full term uh, Natalie has a cesarean section, Beneath was born, and when he was only nine hours of age, he has a four-hour brain surgery to reduce the swell swelling of his brain. He was, you know, they get full of water when that happened. So eight days old, Bennett had a second surgery, six-hour surgery for a spinal because he has the spina bifida. Does that mean that one in one part of the spina is up is coming out the inside? So they need to cover it and put it inside. So this is the surgery that he needed to do. And he was in intensive care for 30 days. In that time, it was difficult because it was COVID time, but thanks to God, the father was still working, but he has to, to travel every other day for one hour to get to the hospital to see the boy, to see the mom who was in the hospital with him. Uh, but he managed to recover. They went back home. And at home, of course, 
they didn't have the opportunity to have any relatives coming to see and help with the care of the baby. It was only a nurse coming uh, only for the first 10 days to help them to care of the children. Because you know, in that time when it was the COVID more difficult, they tried to put the people away from the hospital as much as possible because everything was just for the, for the COVID patients. But uh, thanks to God, he recovered. And now uh, he, you see the baby, he's getting, of course, a, with therapy, he was able to recover very well. And she is just looks like a normal baby. And it thanks to the prayers of our sisters in St. Catherine and the prayer of these parents, of course, that this baby uh, was able to recover. So this is one uh, answer to prayer of our sister, uh, Teresa of the Holy Trinity. Uh, so we are ready now with these two processes that we have, dear mother waiting to be able uh, to fulfill the process. This is our postulator and he has to go to Houston whenever it's open the borders and for waiting the position for our dear sister, uh, Maria, uh, Teresa of the Holy Trinity. Also the devotion to our sister is very well spread, especially also in Asia. And uh, yeah, this is a, a drawing from a boy in Indonesia. Uh, yeah, she's very well known all this way. <laughs> and they trans even translate the, the prayer to ask favor uh, in, in, the, in their language. So we pray that these two processes may continue and yeah, we need a lot of prayer about it because COVID is giving us problem also in that. So we put to all, we have many, all our sisters and all our lay people, we can help us to pray that this process may continue for the glory of God and many also souls can be saved because we have been receiving for many, many lay people from the Carmela order have been also asking for prayers uh, to pray the, the liturgy of the hours of our dear mother in, in, yeah, in Panama, in Mexico, and I think it's Colombia. So we have been also receiving this request. So her devotion is getting every time more bigger, bigger, spread everywhere. But it will be wonderful if we can have her canonization soon. We have this. We have many other more miracles also in Nicaragua. We have trying to get all this documentation, but the COVID is very high in my country. And even Marta had COVID recently, so it has been very difficult because many of these cases have been through Marta that we have been having. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Antoinetta, who was um, a very uh, intense preparing these uh, presentations. And uh, I think we learned very much, by the way, on the medical aspects of diseases, what is always uh, makes us then more aware. Thank you so much, dear sister. You did a very good job. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we, we are excited what the uh, providence of the Lord has uh, decided. And if it's God will, we will see each other very soon at the canonization in Rome. So we are hoping. But however the Lord decides, <laughs> I see you are. <laughs> Yeah. Um, however, the Lord decides we um, uh, are very much now also again encouraged to take our to take this help of intercession of our dear sister, of our dear mother and of our dear sister Teresa Eisenberg. So thank you for your patience and I see you are all there still. And we are coming now to the end. And I would at this end, uh, would like to 
say thank you to the Lord for his grace and his blessings that through this pandemic, we were still able to conduct and extend our general um, conference because this was in this case an extension. We are aware that every time we have meetings, it demands time, money, and a lot of preparation work from each system. That is why I want to take this time to thank every sister from each province who has given of themselves through prayer, work, and financial support so that the costs of this uh, general, conference, general conference was in our family spirit shared. I would like to use the opportunity to tell you that all uh, the presenters was paid except our American ones. They didn't want to receive any payment. And that means that Sister Regina Marie and Sister Marisha um, didn't uh, want any money. Uh, Sister Marisha has requested in return for us to pray for her, for her congregation and vacation, vocations, not vacation, vocations to her congregation. So dear sisters, I would like to ask you to celebrate uh, one holy mess in your province, uh, in each province as um, gratitude to her generosity, to that what she really gave us, not only knowledge, but also experience, and especially the experience of the spirit, what, what she gave a, a, a witness. Of course, uh, Sister Regina Marie is included in that also. I want to thank now, Else, the company which assists us in our technical needs and all the translators whom we keep very busy, I think, <laughs> for their time and labor that allowed each one of us to hear and receive in these past days. We couldn't have done this without your help. In a special way, I thank Sister Anna Maria and Sister Andrea. Sister Anna Maria, the next uh, provincial of the South Central Province, and Sister Andrea, the provincial of the Croatian province, who, despite all the difficulties, managed to attend the general conference in person. Their presence showed us that the physical presence gave an irreplace ir irreplaceable presence that the digital world could not give, even though we were able to have contact with you all there, was a sense of present that was somehow lacking. I hope you understand it in the right way. It's different when we are face-to-face -face speaking and um, see what each other. But we are very thankful that it was possible to have it like we had it in this digital way. And final, yet very important, thank you. Thank you. I want to extend to Sister Diana and all sisters in this community here in Monte Mario. They showed their hospitality every day and bore the weight of the daily task up on their shoulder each day, making it possible for us to have a wonderful experience during the general conference. Thank you, dear sisters. And I would like to add that we arrived in Rome 
and the house was full of Afghanistan refugees and somehow they should have left, but there was complications and they still remained with us a few, a few days. And I would like to give also this witness of these people who was really touched by the love and the hospitality of our community and Sister Diana in Rome. That was, these people, all of them was Muslim, but they felt so much accepted and they felt um, respected from the sisters. And there are many um, examples and I hope we will get um, stories in our echo or on Facebook and on our, our, our web page, uh, which testimony our sisters here gave. And did, that was a very big contribution to the interreligious dialogue. More than every, any um, conference, more than any uh, speech that was by life. And this way is for sure a very, very good way against the terrorism of, of these groups who are uh, very radical. Thank you, dear sisters. Once again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all. If I forgot to mention anyone, please forgive me. But now, that I am, but now that I am grateful to you. With St. Paul, I entrust and pray that the peace of Christ go governs our hearts, the peace to which we are called in one body, Carmel of the divine heart of Jesus. God bless you all. So, and we are now, thank you. We are now, you, you want to say something? Aha, okay, sorry. We have uh, here one um, sister who wants to tell you something. Actually, this is to uh, Mother Carla Maria. Um, on behalf but you can do, do that personal. Oh, no, no. Okay. No, because it's, yeah. Okay. Um, on behalf of all provincial superiors and the Carmel family, um, we wanna thank you for um, allowing us to be here present and via Zoom. Um, and for this en enriching week, the ability to meet as a whole, even though we are not physically in this room, but we are able to present um, in a way that um, we are able to be enriched um, more fully and completely. Thank you for your prayers, your work, and your preparation uh, to strengthen us to become better and to form future uh, superiors. These days have shown that you have taken on the heart of Christ and desire to shepherd us as Christ shepherds his church. The timing of this week has been enriched as well as through our prayers in the liturgy of the hours and in and at the Holy Mass. Thank you from the depths of our hearts for doing all in your ability to give us the necessary nourishment for ourselves and for the future. May these coming months show forth the fruits of this conference. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're very welcome. And I say only amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Anna Maria. Yeah, we are on the, at the end and I want to say goodbye. I'm sure that we will meet one another. When this will be, I don't know, but till then, I wish you God's blessing and thank you. It's only I can say my heart is full of thank you. Renate, do you want to say something? Yeah, okay.
Because ovako, I think I saw that. Sam, Martina sam reći nešto. Ako mogu, As još da ne dulje. I want to say something. Yeah, e, možete. Zahvaljujem vrhovnom vodstvu sestara Karmeličanke Božanskog srca Isusova na čelu s majkom Karlom Marijom od Križa. I, I am thanking the uh, government of the Carmel DCJ na pozivu na konferenciju. For the call to the conference. Neka nas u zajedništvu zbliži ljubav velikog srca Isusova. Uh, we wish that um, that we get closer through the love of the heart of Jesus. Koje želimo štovati. Uh, which we want to um, štovati. Uh, um, želimo štovati devotion. po primjeru Blažene Marije Terezije od Svetog Josipa. On the example of our dear blessed mother Maria Teresa of St. Joseph. Srdečan pozdrav u Kristu i Boži blagoslov. The, uh, uh, greetings and um, sorry, greetings from heart and um, greetings in the heart of Jesus, sorry. Okay. Now we are going to pray the Salve Regina and that Amen. is then the end of our meeting. Okay. We stand up. Amen.